Welcome to Landwards, the podcast for the land-based engineering community, brought to you by the Institution of Agricultural Engineers. I am your host, Andy Newbold, and I am joined today by the newly appointed president of the Institution of Agricultural Engineers, Paul Hemingway. Hello, Paul. Morning, Andy. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Um, I will start with what I will call my air hostess routine, in that um, not only are there no fire alarms planned for this podcast, um, we also have a disclaimer that anything which is represented is the personal opinions of the participants, namely myself as the host and Paul as the guest, rather than representing the formal opinion of the Institution of Agricultural Engineers. That's the disclaimer out of the way. Um, So, Paul, maybe in your own words, can you tell us about your background and why you became an agricultural engineer? Yes, of course I can do that, Andy. But first of all, before I start, could I just say uh, a big vote of thanks to Professor Jane Rickson, our outgoing, and by the way, our first ever lady president, who has just completed a really successful two years in office. She's done a great job and uh, is going to be a hard act to follow for me. Anyway, back to myself. I was uh, was brought up in West Wales within a farming community, although my father wasn't a farmer. He was a municipal engineer, actually, who married a farmer's daughter. So I've spent a lot of my youth on farms. And of course, life then was very different. In in West Wales, typically, uh, a farm was 80 to 100 acres probably milking 40, 50 cows, um, and so very much a family affair. And so there was always work for keen young boys to to help out at busy times, um, or being dairy farms in the main pretty well at any time. Um, The fact that the machinery was small, of course, as well by modern standards and simple to operate, meant that uh, young lads were were very useful around the place. I'd probably have liked to have farmed full time, but uh, I've got a few dust allergies, and so this would have been difficult, and so ag engineering was a a good alternative. Uh, I looked around at degree courses, and uh, there were only two at the time, one at Newcastle University and the other at uh, what was then the National College of Ag Engineering at Silso. I applied to both, but uh, the lure of, of sort of the full university experience, if you like, and also an urban setting. Um, in, in a town like Newcastle, where coming from West Wales, it was a, you know, going to be very, very different. Meant that, that I ended up spending three really happy years in the northeast, uh, and ended up with what I suppose you'd call a, a classical science-based degree in ag engineering. Um, I did have some thoughts halfway through, actually, of transferring on to a new uh, course in agricultural mechanisation that Newcastle was starting up at the time, but. But I was dissuaded uh, from that uh, on the basis that I could always go down that route after qualifying in engineering. So I stuck with it, and uh, I think it was was sound advice that I followed. Yeah, and you clearly had a very, very good good grounding in ag engineering at that stage. Do you like to talk us through your career progression? Well, yes, as I said, I'd I'd spent three years on this science-based degree course. Uh, and so I decided that it would be good to find out a bit more about the practicalities, really, of farm machinery. So uh, I got a job as a trainee service manager for a, uh, a Ford tractor machinery dealership, as it was at the time, down in Cornwall. Uh, they had five or six branches throughout the southwest. So uh, for one reason or another, uh, within about six or eight months, I was made branch service manager. And... Uh, it, it was a steep learning curve. The, the contrast between managing a team of 10 or a dozen service engineers in West Cornwall uh, and the halcyon days of university life less than a year earlier were, were pretty stark. Uh, and I learned a lot of lessons very quickly at that time that have stuck with me. After I'd been down in Cornwall for a couple of years, uh, I spotted a job out of it, actually, in Farmers Weekly, um, Harper Adams College was advertising for a lecturer in ag engineering to support a, a new HND course that they developed. Um, I knew a little bit about Harper because uh, several of my West Wales friends and family had been there, and the job sounded appealing to me, so uh, I had a go at it. And it was at this stage, actually, that I also applied to be a student member of the IA Greek, uh, I guess in an attempt to, to strengthen my job application. Well. 
I was appointed to the Harbour job, and, and for the first time in my career, I found myself part of a small team at the outset of a brand new project. And I spent 11 really very happy years at Harbour. Uh, this included a year on a lecturing exchange down at, uh, in the South Island of New Zealand at, at Lincoln University. Over the years at Harbour, I, I helped the course develop from, from HND into the degree level offering, which still runs today some, some 40 years on. Um, I suppose it was a happy coincidence as well that the, that the Recon branch of the institution generally meets at Harbour Adams. And uh, my colleagues in the engineering department were all members. So active involvement in the branch became very easy for me. Uh, it also created a ready-made network, really, of like-minded people in the area. And several of those have been long-term friends of mine now. Well, in the late 80s, I was approached by JCB to do some consultancy on a project which they had running to develop a high-speed tractor. They'd been selling tenny handlers into agriculture since uh, the late 70s, and it was clear to them that tractor design, as it was then, had some shortcomings for modern farming. Tractors were slow. They had no suspension. They weren't designed for the increased amount of time they were spending on the road or in higher speed field applications. Well, the project progressed, and I was invited by the team to test drive an early prototype alongside other radical machines of the day, I suppose the MB track and the Unimog, in a side-by-side -side comparison, which you can probably imagine for a college lecturer was a pretty privileged day out. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, when it became clear at JCB that the project was a runner, uh, they um, we set about expanding the team, and I was asked to apply for the role of service manager. And, and needless to say, they didn't have to ask twice, I don't think. Um, looking back, those two years I had in Cornwall as a service manager in a dealership stood me in really good stead. And there, for the second time, I found myself part of a small, highly dedicated team in the early stages of development of something. Um, in this case, a brand new concept vehicle. It took about a further 18 months or so for the fast track, as it was to become known to be shown to the market at the Smithfield show in 1990. Seems like a lifetime ago now. The, um, the response was overwhelming. I think it was quite simply the talk of the industry. And I, I count myself as being really fortunate to have been in at the beginning, so to speak. Um, I spent the next 11 years with the fast track team and ended up responsible for service, product marketing, and export sales functions. So in about 2000, I moved across to the construction machine side of the business at JCB, and I spent the last 18 years in a variety of functions, all of them really on the, uh, what I would call the customer facing side of the business. So field service, technical service, dealer training, parts marketing, and so on. So this has given me a great opportunity to work with the JCB dealer network on a global basis, both from the office and on territory around the world. In 2012, I was asked to move with my wife to Delhi to, uh, to take up an appointment as uh, Vice President of Service for JCB India. Uh, it was a reasonable job, really, responsible for a team of about a, 120 or so staff based both within the JCB factories in India and throughout the country in the regional offices. Uh, and this to me was a, it's probably the biggest job I ever had and uh, a really rewarding position, although having said that, it was very hard work. I think the culture shock of, of moving from the UK to a developing country like India, um, with, with the climate, the language, the traffic, everything about it was, was so different. Um, but what I did find in India was a country that, that places real value on their engineers and also on the experience that older people can bring to the business. Well, I retired from, from JCB in, uh, in 2018, and I'm now, uh, life has come full circle. I'm now involved as a visiting lecturer back at Harbour Adams University, as it now is, a, a very different establishment from that which I left 30 years ago. But I'm pleased to say it's really flourishing. Interestingly, on the Harper Adams note, Paul, um, you, you interviewed a very fresh-looking Andy Newbold 
in the autumn of 1988 to uh, to to uh, do a BNG at Harper Adams, which he subsequently did. So you can take either the credit or the blame for interviewing and offering me a place all those years ago. Yeah, um, I, I, did, I did have a good sense to uh, to leave Harper Adams in, in summer '89 before you started. Yeah, it was noted. It was noted. <laughs> um, that, that, that's that's fascinating. Um, what advice do you have to give to younger engineers or potential engineers to help them carry them through their careers? <laughs> it's very tempting, isn't it, to reel off a sort of series of pearls of wisdom to answer that, this sort of question. And when you look at the working world today as it is facing young people, it's so different from the world that I faced 40 years ago that, that some of them wouldn't necessarily read across. So, some do, however. I think probably the understanding that engineering is a, is a critical and really rewarding profession. And, and engineers should be immensely proud of, of the careers they've chosen. The experience we're just going through with COVID-19 just illustrates how important it is that we have some design, some development, some manufacturing capability in, in our own country. None of this happens without engineers. And, and you know, COVID-19 has given us a number of lessons, and there are going to be books written on it, aren't there? But, you know, the importance of having homegrown food in a crisis like this is, is really critical. And uh, food production at any level needs machinery. And hence ag engineering, if you like, as, as I see it at the moment, it's in a bit of a sweet spot. People need food, they need it produced at home, and, and we're right in the place to help farmers and growers do that. I would urge any young people coming, well, frankly, into any job, let alone engineering, to try and develop some excellence in communication, uh, both written and, and verbal communication. Without question, those with good communication skills progress their careers in advance of those with lesser skills. To some it comes naturally, to others it doesn't, they have to really work on it. But uh, I've employed a lot of young people over the years and watched their careers develop. And it's those with communication that really stand out. I think young people have to have ambition, ambition rather, and um, you know, You've got to have some goals, haven't you, about how you want to see your career developing. But, but also at the same time, you know, career development is not an exact science. There's a lot of luck in life. Um, you know, the right opportunity comes up at the right time, or the person whose job you want moves on to create the opportunity for you. You know, I've had an amount of luck in this respect in my lifetime, but, but I also believe that the harder you work, the luckier you get. You can definitely make your own success. Um, be professional as well. I mean, clearly that's what I agree is all about. But the way you act, the way you interact with people, the way you treat people, be professional. You will be thought better of and be a better person for acting in this sort of way. Uh, and I guess last, lastly, don't expect life to be fair. It isn't. You know, nobody said it had to be. Life, as the saying goes, is, uh, is what you make it. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Um, Paul, looking to, at your membership of the Institution of Agricultural Engineers, how has this membership, how has the IAGRI helped you through your development and throughout your career? Well, Andy, as I said earlier, definitely really through networking at both a local and a national level. I think the process for me of getting CN registration was a valuable professional development exercise. It did make me take stock of what I was doing, what I needed to do, um, the responsibility I needed to gain. And it's a recognition, frankly, that I still really value 30 years on. Um, I've always enjoyed reading the Institution Journal, and I've even written a few articles over the years on subjects of interest to me, which, which are good to look back on, but, but hopefully of use to students even, uh, even today. I do think that the fact that we have a specific professional engineering institution for ag engineering is a real bonus. It gives us a real sense of identity and a common interest. It, it also helps, I think, that our institution is one of the smaller ones. So generally, it's a lot more approachable, a lot more flexible than some others, and, and probably easier for uh, anybody who's so inclined as a member to get involved with. 
uh, at local or at national level for that matter. So in short, you know, I've got a lot personally out of membership of the IA group. But in my time, I've also put a fair bit back in. So these two factors are definitely related. So, um, you know, you've had a career, you've had a lifetime in professional agricultural engineering. What, what's your vision, Paul, for ag engineering as, as, a, as a discipline going forwards? Well, I think, I mean, ag engineers over the years, they've always worked really in close harmony with, with the needs of the farming industry. Over my career, broadly, it's all about being, uh, it's, it's been all about maximizing production, bigger, faster, more efficient machines and production systems. And when you stand back and look at the macro picture, the global population is still growing at a, a really alarming rate. You know, we've got seven, something just, around 7.8 billion people, I think, in the world today. And that's forecast to grow to 10 billion by 2050. That's only 30 years' time. And a 25% growth in global population. It's phenomenal. And these people are going to need feeding. But on the other hand, there's also so much focus now, particularly in the Western world, on environmental issues and sustainability. And these two are going to have to be addressed. When you look in the situation in the UK post-Brexit, which uh, we haven't talked about an awful lot over the last eight or 10 weeks for some reason, um, you know, farm support payments are gonna be based heavily on environmental activity. Um, inevitably, this is gonna throw up engineering challenges and the ag engineering industry is gonna to have to rise to them. Well, I'd agree with that 100%. Um so you're you're just taking over the reins as president of the institution now, Paul. What would you like to achieve in your in your two year tenure? <laughs> well, I think anybody coming into this sort of job, you know, would like to see the organisation become larger and stronger during their term of office. Um, having said that, it's probably fair to say that I don't think there's another I agree president who's taken over since the war who's uh, inherited such a time of economic uncertainty as we've got just at the moment. Um, you know, what we are seeing, though, at the moment in this crisis is uh, a change in working practices in a scale that we simply haven't seen before. And uh, it seems inevitable to me that a proportion of these changes are going to stick when we come through the other side. Um, we have got a revolution taking place in, in communications and social networking. And, and this poses real questions for, I suppose, in marketing terms, what you'd call the I agree product offering, as far as its members are concerned. Um, over my, the years that I've been involved with the institution, that you know, we've definitely become more inclusive. We welcome engineers in all roles within the industry, from technicians right up to to chartered level. Um, this does we are, we do have some challenges with how we effectively communicate uh particularly with our younger members you know we've really got to get our heads around social media it's, it's not to say we're starting from scratch here it happens already but we've really got to consolidate and improve this uh we we do have an app in development which we're planning should be available in the next couple of months so this should help particularly our younger members to stay engaged with us in a way that they feel most comfortable. I think also looking at the I agree over the last five or six years, it's become a very broad church, you know, really embracing members from the Society for the Environment, for example, as well as from, from the uh, sort of traditional engineering fraternity. Um, well, in as much as a president can reflect his or his, her own interests, over my period, I'd, I'd like to ensure that we continue to reflect and promote the interests of our engineering membership base. Um, I am just aware that there's some feeling out there that I agree has become a bit diluted in the eyes of some. Um, I'm also aware that we're in a competitive world. Uh, engineers today have got a choice of about 40 different professional engineering institutions that they could be involved with. And, and we just need to make sure that uh, ag engineers stay with us. Now, at the same time, you know, I, I don't think our environmental colleagues should have any fear at all. You know, as I said earlier, they're, they're going to be an ever stronger influencer on, on farming and farm practice and ag engineering activity and uh, 
you know, having their expertise in house, so to speak, is going to be a real bonus for us all. And I can see, you know, a lot more interaction, frankly, between our engineering members and our env environmental members as, as time goes on. Now, turning to some of the sort of specific headlines in ag engineering at the moment, what's your what's your take on the increasingly talked up big data robotics and AI within ag? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, it's, it's probably something to do with my grey hair. I'm not sure, but I'm I'm probably yet to be fully convinced that that we're going to see a paradigm shift in the use of these technologies in, in the near future. Um, I was at the 2019. I agree conference last year, which focused on big data. And I did come away with a sort of not sure about that type of impression. Uh, do farmers need data? Yeah, well, of course they do. Um, you know, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it, as the, the adage goes. The fundamental problem for me in this country is that, you know, we don't have big farming. You know, we're blessed with living on a quite small islands geographically with, with very widely varying topography. The soil types vary, and, and so do the weather patterns. You know, we, we don't have the wide open spaces that they have in, say, the Midwest of the States or in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, where farming's really consistent across vast tracts of land. Um, you know, if you take a farmer, arable farmer, maybe in the Seven Valley, on the western side of the country, you know, his data is not of that much relevance to somebody growing a farmer growing similar crops, perhaps in Northumberland or north of the border up on the Black Isle, uh, where the soils and the weather patterns are very different. So I am sure that the big data will have use, uh, more particularly in the supply industry, I think, whether that's machinery, seeds, fertilizers, chemicals, in terms of tracking patterns, farmer, consumer behavior, if you like. In terms of robots, it's slightly different, I guess. The um, the hands-free hectare project at Harper that's had so much uh, publicity has demonstrated that it's technically possible to automate grain production on a small scale, and, and work is ongoing to scale that up uh, this year. You know, today, many progressive farms are employing automatic guidance on their tractors and combines, and in a sense, agriculture is actually ahead of the automotive sector in this respect. And, and I can see, actually, that it's likely to stay that way. We are seeing, however, you know, a lot of difficulty at the moment with our fruit and veg farmers at, uh, in their efforts in trying to man up for the season. And, and so automated systems of planting and more especially harvesting have to offer a way forward. It's a big challenge, of course, for engineers this because by and large, these horticultural crops ripen in phases. Uh, they don't all come to fruition at exactly the same time and the produce that we're trying to harvest can be very, very tender. So mechanical handling this is, is a real challenge. So in summary on this one, you know, I don't see, I don't share the view that we're going to see a country that's a countryside that's swarming with small robots planting or harvesting crops anytime soon. Uh, I just think that the speed required to establish or harvest a crop will, will dictate that larger machines are used. Particularly, you know, when you see the sort of season that we've been through with the extremely wet winter, farmers simply not being able to establish winter grain crops. And so everybody rushing to plant in as soon as the ground dried up in the spring. Uh, so I can always see that uh, there's going to be some human intervention. It does seem we're getting more and more of these extreme weather events. Um, I, th I think what farmers have shown down the years, though, is that, that if if the technology can be made available, you know, which makes their work easier, quicker, and, and hopefully at lower cost, they're never slow to adopt it. You know, I think our farmers have got a really good um, reputation, uh, and rightly so, for adopting new technology. Yeah, and, and, and change, whatever we say, change is often, often slower than we think. But um, if the need is there, change can be very fast. Um, so... Let's let's think about the current current time. So, given the times we're living in, um, bear in mind this is being recorded in in on the twelfth of May. So, um, you know, given the times we're living in, how can an ag engineer offer solutions within lockdown? <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, well, it seems to me, in a sense, that that ag engineers thought of this some time ago, really. Um, I mean, when you look at the scale of, of uh, field machinery and fixed equipment on farms today, you know, it has, by and large, dramatically reduced the number of people involved. Um, so, you know, in comparison to my young days, now it's it's very common for seven or eight hundred acre arable unit to really be run by one person, uh, just with a bit of help at harvest, or one person milking two hundred cows through a modern parlour or with the help of a robotic setup. Um, so, you know, I think, I think you know, it is acknowledged um, that, that many farmers today are more or less in a situation of permanent self-isolation. Now, as I said earlier, if you look at intensive fruit and veg, that's, that's a very, very different situation. Um, in terms of support for the farmers, I think my sense is that the farm machinery dealers have, have tended to remain open, at least at a level, and their engineers have been supporting our farming customers who've been incredibly busy, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, just um, you know getting on with a crop establishment in in the uh, in the wake of this incredibly wet winter. Behind the dealers, then the manufacturers, part supply businesses have stayed very much open, um, and uh, I think what this whole crisis you know, is flagging up is that those companies who have embraced technology, who have um, developed good online communication technology, whether that's parts ordering um, or, or delivery, are those which are flourishing today. Um, and going forward, you know, you have to suspect that having this is no longer going to be an option. It, it's simply going to be an end ticket to the game. If, if you want to play in our industry, you've got to be able to, to transact digitally. It's, it's become the default way to get anything, whether, whether that be um, your food shopping at the moment, Paul, for most people, let, let alone a filter pack for a tractor or, or a bearing or you know whatever else is required. Um, just taking the long view, Paul, and this I think is probably my final question, you know, what step changes have you seen in ag engineering during your career? And what do you think the next ones will be? Yeah, I must admit, I was at Lama back in January. Again, that seems like an awful long time ago when we could actually get out and meet people. But it did strike me then, when I, when I sort of thought back to, to the first Smithfield show I went to back in the early 70s, you know, it was unrecognizable, frankly, when you look at the machinery. Um, Having said that, you know, it's a long time ago. That was 40 years ago. Uh, and if you'd have gone back another 40 years before that, you know, the prime mover on most farms would have had four legs. So, so perhaps our change has not been that significant. Um, what have the big changes been? Well, well, obviously, organization of the industry uh, and the supply chain, frankly, from field to plate. Um, farms have got bigger, of course. They've specialized in what they do. There aren't the same number of truly mixed farms today or anything like. Um, far greater use of contractors to, to undertake specialized operations on farms. And of course, the supermarkets are dominating the retail sector with their immense buying power. And, and, and so, you know, they are dictating so much of what happens on farm today. When you look across to the machinery then, you know, that's just increased to a size that the farmer of the the early 70s wouldn't recognize. Um, and this has a direct bearing. It's not just about the farmer, but, but on the size and the structure of dealer that's able to supply and trade this sort of equipment. You know, it is, we're dealing with an awful lot of very high ticket machinery these days, and, and that has specific demands on the dealer network. And, and so we are seeing um, differences in the policies of the manufacturers as who they can appoint as dealers. Um, in, uh, in specific areas. The use of electronics, I suppose, we looked at in the early days with some skepticism. You know, it'll never survive on a tractor. It'll never survive in a milking parlor. I think, by and large, those pundits have been proved wrong. Uh, you know, they have been able to produce durable electronics uh, that do live in a farm situation, by and large. And, of course, digital data capture is massive now. You know, when you look at global positioning, automatic guidance on tractors, yield mapping, and so on, um, that's that's technology which is which has really developed. 
on the people side, of course, far fewer people involved in the industry today, you know, unless you're into intensive horticulture. Uh, and, and the, you know, the, the flip side of that is that those people that are there have got to be well educated. They've got to know what they're doing and they've got to be really flexible and adaptable as well. What, what are the future? What are we going to see? Well, if, if we just restrict it to, to the UK and Western Europe, really, I think machine size is probably just about maxed out. I think, you know, we have a constraint with the, with the space we've got to work in. Our field sizes are, are not colossal. Uh, I think there is an increasing awareness of the damage caused by, by putting massive amounts of weight on the soil, even with state-of-the-art tires or tracks. So I think the machine size will plateau out. Um, there will be increasing use of electronics. There's no question that we're on that road. And, uh, you know, the more it can do for us, the better, frankly. And as far as farms are concerned, you know, subsidies are going to reduce. And I think Brexit or no Brexit, you know, the, the writing was on the wall some years ago that the, the EU simply couldn't support farmers on, on the way that they have uh, over the last 30 years. And uh, so farmers are going to have to rely on the, uh, the efficiency of the operations. You know, they're not going to get paid on a, on a euros or a pounds per hectare basis anymore. Um, you know, if you look at the, the data today, then the figure banded about is that 42% of UK farms, 42% are not viable if you, if you, they don't get any subsidy. Well, that's, you know, that's not sustainable business. You know, and when you look at a business, it doesn't matter what business it is, you know, it comes down, it comes down to six words. People can either sell more or they can increase the price of their goods or they can reduce the cost. Sell more, increase price, reduce costs. Well, you know, farms, farms are not like most other businesses. They tend to buy stuff retail and sell wholesale. And that's not normally a great business proposition. Many sell on, a, on contract, so they don't have control over the price. You know, ask any dairy farmer. If they want a different price, they've got to change contract. And there aren't that many options. So fundamentally, farmers are left with having to reduce costs to stay in business. And, and I'm sure that uh, that's something that's going to generate huge focus um, in the near future. And uh, this farming taking... Um, cost out, stripping as much as possible out of the farm situation if they want to stay viable is something that farmers are going to have to do. And the ag engineers behind them are going to have to rise to the challenge of uh, designing and building machinery to suit, to suit this new constraint. Well, you know, Paul, that has been an absolutely fascinating insight, I have to say. Um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed listening to your, your professional journey, your your thoughts on career development and your thoughts on where where the industry is going and how ag engineers fit in with that. That's a really, really good, um, you know, albeit in 30 minutes, um, romp around a very, very large subject area. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Um, so you've been listening to the incoming president of the Institution of Agricultural Engineers, Paul Hemingway, talking to myself, Andy Newbold, today on the Landwards podcast. Thank you, Paul, for your time. Thanks very much indeed, Andy. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It is much appreciated. And we will look forward to coming back to you soon with some other interesting um, conversation. For more information, visit www.iagri. Org. You have been listening to Landwards, the podcast for the land-based engineering community, brought to you by the Institution of Agricultural Engineers.